Hello, thank you for watching. My name is Jesper and I'm a student of medicine currently doing my last year before graduating as a medical doctor. This will be a two-part video where I will talk about some immunodeficiency disorders seen in pediatric patients in the next video, as well as in this video hold a brief introduction and recap of what the immune system is and how it acts. The immunity is a huge topic and I've tried to simplify it here and I really think if you see this video and try to memorize it you'll have a good overview. So essentially when we talk about the immune system we really talk about all the structures and processes of our body that protects and defends us from various infectious microbes and pathogens such as bacteria, viruses, fungi, some cells of our immune system can even help us recognize mutated cells and prevent cancer. We group the immune system into the innate and the adaptive immune system. The innate immune system is the part of the immune system responsible for recognizing foreign pathogens and materials. And then mounting a response towards it. A key thing to remember about the innate immune system is that it is non-specific. And what we mean by non-specific is that it defends against essentially any pathogen and it does not cause a better response after encountering a specific pathogen successively several times in a row. However, the adaptive system is specific. What I mean by that is that for a particular antigen the response will improve by each encounter with that specific antigen and in the same way a infection caused by a disease can lead to immunity for the next time the body encounters that same pathogen. Going back to the innate immune system we remember we said it's non-specific so let's talk about some of the non-specific defense components and responses that are essentially used by the innate immune system. So let's start with physical barriers. Just as simple as the skin, even hairs in our nose or secretion like sweat. In simple terms, these physical barriers block the access of foreign pathogens to our body. Next up, we will talk about phagocytes. These are also known as phagocytic cells, and they are cells of our immune system that engulf or eat up pathogens and debris. Examples of these phagocytic cells are macrophages, neutrophils, and monocytes. Another cell we need to talk about is the natural killer cell. And these are cells that induce apoptosis in a cell that is either infected by a virus or it could also be a mutated cell from a tumor. So just to recap, apoptosis was the process in which a cell destroys itself without causing an inflammatory process. It's referred to as programmed cell death or even cell suicide. The next process is fever. So leukocytes such as mononuclear cells can produce certain cytokines like interleukin-1, which are just proteins that can signal the hypothalamus, which is the center in the brain, to raise the body temperature, hence leading to a fever. Fever is roughly speaking when the body temperature rises to above 37 degrees. It's very unspecific and that's why it makes the individual with the fever even feel sick and in severe cases it can lead to death. The next part of the innate immune system that we will talk about is the complement system and this always confused me in biology and immunology but just think of it as a subsystem that complements the immunity. The main components are proteins circulating in the blood and when they are activated they induce opsonization and killing of bacteria. So what is opsonization? Well opsonization is a process in which a pathogen like a bacteria or virus is marked so that the phagocytes better know what cells to engulf. Another role it has is to attract 
neutrophils and other phagocytic cells to an area of inflammation. It does this by a process called chemotaxis, where cytokines and chemokines attract phagocytic cells, causing them to migrate. When we divide it into first and second and third line of defense, the first line of defense would be skin and mucous membranes. The second line of defense would be phagocytic cells, inflammation, fever, and antimicrobial substances. The third line of defense would be the specific immune system. Let's start off by looking at this small diagram of the hematopoiesis. The hematopoiesis just refers to the production, proliferation, and maturation of the different blood cells from where they start off as stem cells and precursor cells within the bone marrow and later go out to the organs and blood. So the stem cells are cells within the bone marrow that can differentiate into a wide variety of different cells. In this diagram you can see how some of these comes about, like for example the macrophage, which is a further differentiation from the previous cell from the monoblast, which again came from a stem cell, and so on. So let's start now with the B lymphocytes. These are both differentiated from stem cells within the bone marrow, and they also mature in the bone marrow. Hence the name B lymphocytes, B for bone marrow. They are cells responsible for the production of antibodies, which also are called immunoglobulins. To be exact, the B lymphocytes mature into plasma cells, which then secrete antibodies. The B lymphocytes also have other roles and functions. However, the production and secretion of antibodies is one of the primary functions. The antibody is a protein shaped like the letter Y. They act by latching onto an antigen, like for example a bacteria or a virus, with the intention of immobilizing that pathogen. Sometimes, when the immune system is not working properly, or even overworking, you could say, antibodies can sometimes mistake our own body's tissues for a pathogen, thereby attacking our own cells, unfortunately. This can be the case for certain infections or processes after certain infection, like, for example, rheumatic fever, which is when the body mistakes tissues within joints or even our heart for a streptococcus antigen. This would be after you could have had a streptococcus infection in your throat. Later, the body could think that the streptococcus antigens are still there and thereby attacking the wrong sites of the body, like joints or even cells within the heart, thereby calling it rheumatic fever. Very short about the structure of the Y-shaped antibody. It consists of two light chains and two heavy chains. One light chain is then paired with one heavy chain to form two halves of the respective antibody. There's also two sides, one on each half, where the antibody attaches to the antigen. Next up, we'll talk about T-cells. In general, T-cells can recognize an antigen or a pathogen, let's say, when they are presented on the surface of those other cells. The way they recognize the antigens is by reading the so-called major histocompatibility complex, or MHC for short. And this is a sort of a cell's passport, and it's located on that cell's surface. Actually, all nucleated cells have their own MHC class molecule so that they can be recognized. Mature red blood cells are non-nucleated, meaning they do not possess a nucleus and they do not express MHC. However, there are other cells without a nucleus, like for example the platelets, that do have a surface MHC complex. There are several types of T cells. Some of them are the T helper cells, the T helper 1 cell, is the T cells that interacts and helps phagocytes to destroy pathogens. The T helper 2 cell is the ones that interact and help B cells to divide. Then there are cytotoxic T cells and they are responsible for destroying the cells of the body 
which have been infected with an intracellular pathogen. So for example, a virus or bacteria that acts intracellularly, meaning the pathogen resides and replicates within the host cell, then the cytotoxic T cell can kill that host cell to prevent the further spread of a virus or bacteria. If we go back and take a look at the hematopoiesis chart again, we have talked about the B lymphocytes and plasma cells. The T lymphocytes we mentioned that macrophages are cells that phagocytize cells or engulf them. And let's also shortly look at the myeloid lineage of cells. These are granulated leukocytes. And as I said, leukocyte is just another word for white blood cell. These granulated leukocytes contain enzymes which they can release in response to some irritant or allergen. A good example is histamine, which you may know as the major contributor to allergy. That's why people take antihistamines to calm down their allergic symptoms. Eosinophils are, roughly speaking, responsible for dealing with parasites. Basophils, roughly speaking, for releasing histamine in response to an allergy. And neutrophils are one of the first cells to show up at an area of infection or wound site. Now for completeness sake, let's look back at the hematopoiesis picture and look at thrombocytes. These are also known as platelets. They are the cells that stick together to prevent bleeding if blood, for example, escapes a vessel due to some injury, trauma or even a rupture. They don't have a nucleus, but as I said, they do express MHC molecule surface protein or aka passport. Lastly, red blood cells or erythrocytes are without nucleus and they carry oxygen via the blood to the tissues and organs all around the body. The reason why it can bind oxygen and release it is due to the mole molecule hemoglobin, which is an iron bound molecule that red blood cells possess. Now that was it for this video, a lot of info and I tried to simplify it and I really hope you could make some sense of it or that it was of help to you. Thank you so much for watching and if you liked this video and if it was helpful, if you could subscribe to our channel it would mean the world to us. Have a great day.